My name is Grant, and thank you for watching our technical product video. Today we'll be discussing the AC servo motor theory with specific emphasis on the NX information. Uh, the NX is an AC servo motor, um, but specifically we'll be covering the overall theory of AC servo motors in general. So if we look at the structure of an AC servo motor, we see that we have a typical motor setup of a shaft, a stator, and a rotor. We can see clearly here that we have two ball bearings housing the rotor. We, the AC servo motor is a permanent magnet type rotor. And we see that the coils are fixed to the stator. Now pretty much what makes a servo motor a servo motor is the inclusion of an encoder which is located usually on the end part of the motor. We see here we also have two uh, separate lines coming out uh, for the uh, motor signals. One for the encoder and then one for the motor uh, which would be typically just in a three phase winding configuration. Now these are separated uh, in order to lessen the effects of electrical interference and noise. Now an AC servo motor is basically this similar to a brushless design. Um, we can see that there are no physical brushes, we have a permanent magnet rotor, and then we have a three phase winding configuration, U, V, and then W. Now what happens in order to generate motion, we're just going to activate those windings on in a specific order to thus generate motion. We can see here the typical switching sequence um, will be shown here. On the first sequence, the U and the W are activated, so we have current running through the U and then exiting out the W knot. And then the next sequence, we have current running through the V and then out the W knot. And then finally, on the third sequence, we have current entering in through the V and then exiting out the U knot. So it's just going to repeat that cycle over and over and over again to generate motion. Here's another way to look at that same switching scheme. So on the first step we have current entering in the U phase and then exiting the W knot phase. And notice that there's two um, windings on at all time. And then we have current entering the V phase and then exiting out the W phase. And then third step, again, we have current still entering in the V phase and then exiting out the U phase. Now, by changing the frequency of how fast these switch on and off, we can change the speed. And ultimately, we can help curb the amount of rotations by keeping track of the switching as well. Now, one thing to note about the AC servo motor is it is going to have what is typical to a DC torque speed curve. Because it is a permanent magnet motor, we can see that as the voltage increases in the motor, we can increase the output torque and ultimately the speed as well. So if we see here on this chart, we should see torque on the vertical y-axis and speed on the horizontal x-axis with different voltages, voltage one, two, and three, we can see different performances based upon the level of the voltage. Again, going back to what really makes a servo motor a servo motor is the inclusion of the encoder. An encoder is a sensor which detects the rotational angle, the rotational speed, and the rotational direction of the motor. Basically, it's an optical uh, slit disc that's mounted onto the shaft and through an LED and a phototransistor keeps track of the actual rotation angle of that shaft. By sending out a, when the LED light trans, transfers through the slit disc, it activates the phototransistor. So every time one of these slots or these um, openings passes, the phototransistor is then activated. And now, Encoders are classified into two types, either an incremental type encoder or an absolute encoder. Now here is another representation. 
Again, we have our rotor and slip disc with the LED then activating the phototransistor. Every time that phototransistor is activated, it's going to send out a square wave. Now, typically with in incremental type encoders, a return to electrical home operation is necessary when the power supply is turned off, simply for the fact that um, most of the time that information is stored in some type of volatile memory on the drive. Um, however, with an absolute encoder, um, that is not necessary because the information is specific to the actual fixed angle of the rotation of that disk. So here, with an incremental encoder, we see that we just have a number of slots all the way around to equal a certain amount of information, be it 500 counts per rev or 1,000 counts per rev, um, incremental type encoder. With an absolute encoder, um, it's a bit more specific. We actually take specific information on that disk um, stored in usually a binary type scheme to specifically call the specific angle on the rotation of that disk. So, for example, at 45, the sensor output may look like this in binary. At 90 degrees, it might look a little different, so on and so forth. Now, return to mechanical home is not necessary with an absolute encoder um, when moving between 0 and 360 degrees uh, simply for the fact that that specific angle on the um, encoder is actually kept track of on the encoder and not in volatile memory in the driver. So here's an actual uh, or example of an actual design of an absolute encoder. So we can see that on the outermost portion we have the single digit and then the next digit and the next digit and so on and so forth. So we'll actually output a binary scheme. And then also notice that once per revolution is the what is known as the Z phase. Um, and this will output one pulse per revolution. And we can use that to um, keep track of um, information for homing and uh, for other more precise movements. Um, and the A and B phases will output like an incremental encoder um, with the absolute um, the exact same fashion which is typically output by the driver at that point. So, again, what makes a servo motor a servo motor is primarily feedback that is sent back from the encoder. Um, a servo motor is actually based upon error. Um, what you will see is we information is comes in in this uh, block diagram into the deviation counter. That information is then, then sent to a position amp, a speed amp, and then a current amp, and then we activate uh, the FET transistors in order to generate and turn on the motor and run at a specific speed and hopefully a specific distance. But what happens, um, because of the design of the motor, the information is then sent back through the encoder, and that's, again, put into the deviation counter and compares the actual commanded position to where the actual position is of the motor. And since it's based on air, um, the motor will basically run as it's commanded, um, and then the drive's going to have to then make up for any type of air that incurs while moving. So this information is sent back to a frequency to voltage converter, and also the rotor position counter, which is sent to the phase sequencer. And then again, makes corrections to the FETs as needed. So here's a torque speed curve of what the actual performance output would look like from a servo motor. The servo motor line, which is in pink, you can see that it's relatively flat up to about the 3 to 3500 RPM range and then begins to drop down. Now similar to that of a step motor, we can see that the step motor has much higher starting torque, but as the speed increases, the torque drops down, um, approaching the 2,500 to 4,000 RPM range, and then there's not much usable torque after that, where we can see we still have usable torque with the servo motor. So when this uh, motor is then commanded to move, um, we have to also factor in uh, what are called gains. Now the gains have to do with the, uh, the voltage settings um, 
at which the motor will then make corrections. So if we have a typical motion profile where we have speed on the vertical y-axis and time on the horizontal x-axis, we want to generate a motion that will look like this. Accelerate up and then plateau and then run at a constant speed. So what happens if the gain is set too high? Well, you're going to end up with something that looks more like this. So we have our commanded position, and then note, there's going to be a bit of a delay, um, again, because we have to really base our position upon error or the feedback from the encoder. But when the gain is set too high, it's going to overshoot that speed and then finally come back down because it's correcting, eventually settle out, and then run at the, the commanded speed. So notice that there will be a bit of delay. So when, what happens when the gain is set too low? So we don't want to overshoot. We want to come to a more gradual and not pass our mark. Well, then you're going to see an excess, an even greater amount of delay. So again, instead of accelerating up and then plateauing and running at our set speed, it's then going to gradually accelerate up, won't overshoot, but again, there's going to be an even more amount of delay when the gain is set too low. So what could have took maybe 50 milliseconds may now take 150 milliseconds. So again, low gain versus high gain. Now, of course, these uh, can be overcome um, by doing what is called gain tuning. Um, typically, you can um, tune in a servo motor based on a specific application to run in the, the desired range of what you find suitable. Now, also notice um, there's another uh, phenomenon that may you may encounter with a servo motor, um, which is called hunting. And basically, when the gains are set too high, it might actually oscillate back and forth to one pulse. Um, with the best possible tuning, accuracy is always going to be plus or minus one pulse um, of the encoder resolution. Um, and that, in some cases, can be pretty difficult to achieve. And when the gain is set too high, it may actually oscillate back and forth between one pulse. So instead of stopping specifically on A, you might actually go back to B, overshoot, go back to C, come back to A, and then keep oscillating between these three points. Now that is uh, not the same type of situation with a stepping motor, um, because a stepping motor is not based on air, it's based on a position and a commanded sequence. So it's going to just basically stop at the, the highest torque uh, vector, um, typically when it's stopped. Notice the difference between an NX and then the AR displacement on the bottom. We can see here with the NX, and then the AR is a bit more rigid when it comes to the stop amount. So I'd like to thank you for watching this video. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to contact us at 1-800-468-3982 or email us at techsupport at orientamotor.com. And I'd also like to encourage you to watch the other videos uh, specific to the NX uh, Servo Motor product series. My name is Grant, and thank you for watching.